here backstage at the Atkinson Southport to get a few words with one line of comedian Gary Delaney. Hi Gary, it's great to meet you. Hey man. Hello, nice to meet you. Good to see you, I kid. We're going to pass this round like we're sharing an ice cream. Really confused. <laughs> Otherwise, we've got to hug to do it, and that'd be weird. I'll <laughs> oh, come here. That's, that's probably right. easier. Although, I probably look a little bit like a paedophile now. I probably should be a little bit careful. <laughs> How is the Gagster's, Gagster's Paradise tour going? Yeah, it's going great. I mean, I would say that. If it was going shit, I'm not going to come on here and go, oh, it's awful. Oh, they all hate me. I've sold no tickets. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's going really well. You know, the audiences are, are really up for it, and, you know, people are coming... It's kind of easier now because I've been around a while. People know what I do. They know their one-liners. They know some of their ingenious tastes and the people who come along like that sort of stuff and we have a good time. But we just added a load more dates until like March next year. So yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. I'm very happy. How did you get into comedy? Well, I was always on the fringes of the circuit. They, in, in comedy clubs, there's often people who are on the edges of it. They're doing the sound desk or they're you know, putting out the tables or helping out in the door, whatever it is. And, and quite a few, some of them are just comedy fans and some of them are people who want to get into comedy and they're just trying to get up the nerve and study. I did the sound desk. A lot of comics did the sound desk at comedy clubs, you know, huge amounts of them. Um, uh, and so I kind of wanted to do it. I never had the nerve. Um, and then in the 90s, an old college mate of mine, uh, Martin Lewis, the money-saving guy off the telly, he dabbled in stand-up and, and I used to help him write his jokes. So I used to go along to his gigs and sit at the back, sort of vicariously enjoying the laughter. And then, and, and then, then he, he, he jacked it in, and I was like, I kind of didn't have an outlet. So he bet me that I wouldn't have the nerve to, to, to do it myself, so I did. I did, I gave it a gig, I did a gig, and uh, I got some laughs, and I was like, oh, that's good. So that's what I did from then on. Yeah, that's my origin story. Were your parents supportive at first, or did they tell you to get a real job? That's a good question. Let me measure my response. Um, I think... A job in entertainment is hard for people to understand. Um, and most of the general public have an idea that if you're successful, that means on the telly. And if you're not on the telly, that means you're nothing. Now, because the, the comedy circuit in the UK, because I was on the circuit for many, many years before I ever got on telly, you can make a wage and make a living just by playing the clubs without anybody knowing who you are or now out ever being on the telly. So you'd be in a situation where you're, you know, I gave up my job and spent 10 years going around clubs and making a living, but nobody had heard of me. So that is quite a hard pitch to people to say, actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good at my job, I know what I'm doing. Once you get on, so once I got on like Mock the Week and stuff, it's very easy, everyone goes, oh, clearly that's what he does. But up until then, it was a harder sell for people. People didn't necessarily know that I, I was any good or accept it as a real job. So people, you know, would make comments, oh, you know, you used to have a proper management job and, you know, no. And I did, but this is better. But yeah, it, it's, I wouldn't say they're unsupportive, but it's, most comics, if they're being honest, will say that it took their parents or their family a while to adjust and understand it because it's, you know, it's tough. I, I, have, I have a comedy friend who I won't name, and he said it, his parents didn't really appreciate that he had a real job until he was on the Royal Variety performance. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's how it can be. Because it's not, not, it's not in any mouth. People, it's, it's a job that people don't really understand. It's so far from their, their world, their everyday experiences. It's, it's hard for people to get, get their, their grip around that you, you, might, you, know, you might not be a huge name but be OK. And also, it's a job that there are loads of crazy, deluded people doing it who are useless. <laughs> you don't know who's who unless you know a bit about the scene. So that's a very long, much longer answer than you were expecting. With you being on tour a lot, do you find it hard being away from friends and family? I go home nearly every night. I drive a huge amount. Unless I'm at the top of Scotland or in Cornwall or something, I nearly always go home. So I, I just pollute the planet and do huge amounts of miles and get in at 3 o'clock in the morning so I can get back to, to my wife and my cat and my dog. I don't like being away. I don't like being in hotels. I'll do it when I have to, but I, I try and avoid it. I try to always go home. It's depressing being on the road on your own in hotels so you know when you start off it's really novel you go oh, i'm staying in a hotel yay and then after 15 years even if it's a really nice hotel you just rather go home being married to a comedian does that make mealtimes hilarious no that's yeah me, no, meal times uh, we're both quite focused on eating so we don't tend not to let humor get in the way of such important tasks I mean, we do have a laugh in our, in our home life, but meals, you know, meals are a priority. You're not going to let, let uh, wit get in the way of that, frankly. More likely to be a discussion as to whose turn it is to cook it. Stroke, drive to the takeaway. You are a one-line comedian. How on earth do you remember them all? All right, the proper answer? The method of Loki, otherwise known as a memory palace. Uh, I can be very boring about this. I'll give you a very potted summary. Um, 
memory techniques, Greeks and Romans, were really into them. And they all died out with the printing press, right? Because everyone had books. But everyone back in the day, academics, philosophers, they had to learn everything, right? All the old poets and whatnot. It wasn't written down. They learned it all. There's all these memory techniques um, that are all based on visualization. That's how the human memory works. Your, your memory is a caveman's memory, right? We haven't evolved that much since we were on the African plains. Uh, so we struggle with numbers and names and words and stuff, right? They're hard to remember. But I'll tell you what you're brilliant at remembering, places, right? Um, in the middle of the night, you could get up in pitch black and walk to the bathroom without tripping over uh, your bed or a pile of clothes that you got on the floor, because you know where those things, because you learn that stuff really easily. You could probably close your eyes now and reasonably well describe this room to me, right? So that's what your brain learns easily. So you take what you want to learn, a show, and you map it up to something that you already know. Now this week, I've done this tour show tonight that you've seen, which has got 300 jokes in it. I, did, I recorded two other old shows in Liverpool on Wednesday that each had 200 jokes in. So for this week, I had to learn, as well as the 300 jokes I've got in my mind for this, I had to learn another 400 correctly and in sequence. Um, so 700 in all, and you can do it if you learn the places. So I, I, you know, usually I use my house, and I have the, my jokes as, as striking visual images dotted around the house. Um, but because I ran out of space this week, I also had to use my old flat in Birmingham and my dog walk and you know, my garden and things on my road and things like that, just, just to take things that I know and I'm familiar with. And, just, and then you, know, you take the mental image, you make it as vivid and outrageous and rude as possible, and you put it in the place of what you want to know. So, that, that, so all mental images, all, all memory techniques work as visualization images. It's really old, old, old brain hacks from the days before Gutenberg. Having traveled extensively, what's the most memorable thing that's happened to you? Um, hmm. uh, I did a gig. It wasn't very far from uh, where I was living at the time. It was, in, it was in Midland. In the Midlands, it was a biker rally. It was in a tent on a hot, sun, hot sunny day. And I was on stage at the back of the tent. And it was going really well. The biker rallies were great. And then halfway through, I thought I'd found the secret of comedy because the audience were roaring at everything I did and said. And then I realized they weren't always roaring at the right time. And I thought, something else is going on here. And then I realized that behind me, uh, it was a festival gig. So the toilets there are always a nightmare, right? And the audience were bikers and Hells Angels. And that. It, was a, it was a National Association of Bikers with Disabilities. It was one of their events, right? Because obviously, bikers have lots of accidents, you know. Um, so what had happened was one of the guys in the audience had gone out. He decided not to use the port loos because they were gross. And there was people there. So he thought, right, I'll slip around the back of the tent and I'll go to the toilet there. He hadn't realized it was bright sunshine behind him and behind me. So he basically became a shadow puppet of a hell's angel taking a wee right behind me on the stage. And he got far more laughs than I ever have. I was doing my jokes behind me. Was it, if you've ever been to Belgium and seen the mannequin piss, right, whatever it's called, that little, you know, that's what was basically portrayed as a shadow puppet behind me. Uh, and, and, and until I realized what was going on, I thought I'd become the funniest comedian in the world. And then I realized they were all just laughing at somebody having a wee. Where would you like to gig, to, to gig most? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I like gigging in the UK just because I can drive home. Uh, international gigs, I don't do that many because I don't fly. I hate flying, so that limits things. I would like to do a few in the United States to see if my humour worked over there. I'd like to try a gig at the Comedy Store in LA, see if I was funny there. But given that I'm extremely reluctant to get on a plane to go there, and given that I might not work, I have, you know, it will probably never happen. But that would be the place outside the UK that I'd do. If you do go to America, just don't tell the double the audience joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah quite bitch. <laughs> no, they have their own sensitivities, yes. What has been your proudest moment? Good question. Um, leaving my job. That, was, that felt great to be able to make a living doing this. Getting married. Um, but when I feel proud, it's, when I do a really good show, and it's my show, and people have come, and they've had a great night, and it, you know, and I, the non-corn is overrun, and just everyone's, you know, I get messages, people say, oh, my face hurts, and all that sort of stuff. And I'm like, well, good, that's what's supposed to happen. I'm a comic, that's what's supposed to happen. What's everyone else doing? When, when, you know, when, when I've, I've had a really great show, and everyone's just got tears in their faces, you know, that, that's, when I, that's when I feel proudest. Who would you most like to work with? I would be a writer, a staff writer on The Simpsons on series four, five, or six. So Matt Groening is probably the answer to that. 
You are also a writer for Kerrang Radio. Does that mean you're into rock music? Bit. I, I some of my early writing work for, was just for Kerrang in Brum. It's quite hard to get into writing work, so I used to do lots of work for little money or, or no money um, in, in Birmingham. And um, so, no, I'm not. I, I mean, I've got, I've got loads of rock on my iPod, but it's all you know, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, that sort of stuff. It's, it's all classic rock, so it's probably not the sort of stuff that. Uh, that you're, that you're listening to nowadays. So it's exactly the sort of stuff you'd expect a man my age to listen to, you'd, frankly. You'd be surprised what I was on my playlist. All right, good. Go on. Yeah. Well, Molly Crew. Deep Purple Crew. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love it. Love that stuff. Loads of Pink Floyd. Not exactly rock, but yeah. Okay. What do you guys do before you go on stage? Are there any rituals? Check my fly zipped up. <laughs> I do a little chant a Buddhist taught me years ago. I'm not a Buddhist, I don't believe it has any great spiritual influence, but it helps relax and calm and focus me before I walk out onto stage, and I go for a series of increasingly tiny, nervous whees. You've done TV work in the past. Is that something you would like to get into? TV's hard, right? It's hard, and you don't have the control over what you say, and you're not, you have lots of things you're not allowed to say and whatnot. Um, in stand-up, you have absolute control over everything you do and everything you say, and, and in TV, you have very little control, so it's not as much fun. Um, honest answer... TV, I will always take all the TV I'm offered, cause, but TV is something that you do to sell tickets. It's hard, and you don't get to do what you want. So I will always accept TV whenever it is on offer, but TV is a means to an end. TV is a reason. You do TV to, to, do, to tour and sell tickets. That's the answer. In previous interviews with comedians, I'd, I'd tell a few, joke, a few jokes. This time, how about you try and guess the point to if Yeah, sure. I'd love a bit of that. Yeah, go for it. Never buy shoes off a drug dealer. Never buy shoes off a drug dealer. Okay, right, so what am I associated for? So you've got soul, you've got... Uh, your dad's trying to mime something to me, and I've got no idea what it is. I think it's ballet. I, I, go on, I, I can't do it, I can't get it. I'm quite annoyed at myself for not getting it. Go on, what is it? I do, I've been tripping all day. Ah, bloody hell. <laughs> all right, that's what you were doing. I thought you'd just become very camp. Okay. <laughs> all right, try me again. My dog used to chase people on a bike. Oh, it's impressive that you've got a dog that can ride a bike. But that's got repetition in it, so, uh, uh, which was difficult because his feet couldn't reach the pedals. Got so bad, I had to take the bike away from him. Yeah. What's the stupidest animal in the jungle? I'm going to pretend to be one of the really earnest political campaigning comics and go, hey, it's man cutting down the trees when the planet needs them to breathe. I've no idea. Go on, what is it? It's obviously polar bear. Sorry? It's obviously polar bear. Oh, polar bear. Oh, nice, nice. That's very good. That's a good joke. That is a good joke. That's a genuinely good joke. Well done, you. That's the end of the interview. Thank you for your time. It has been an honour. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.